Question number one. You should cover your cargo because many states require it to protect your cargo from bad weather to protect individuals from any spilled cargo all of these are correct question number two what can you do at an accident site to help avoid another accident correct answer is put out warning devices so people don't run into the accident site we have a explanation here unless you are injured as a commercial driver it's your duty to ensure that drivers see your vehicle at the accident scene you should put out warning devices as quickly as possible as a means towards preventing further accidents for example a pileup question number three what is not one of the four skill areas that operating a commercial motor vehicle requires so in this particular case you're looking for a skill that is not required for operating a CMV commercial motor vehicle what is not required is a first aid certification okay uh, but the required ones are steering accelerating and safely backing so let's go over the explanation while first aid certification could certainly come in handy at some point during your career it is not one of the four skill areas mentioned that you must be proficient in for safe vehicle operation question number four how many tie downs are required for a 20 foot load the correct answer is two tie downs and we have a bit of an explanation here so let's go over that the rule is that you should have one tie down per 10 feet of cargo and you must have at least two per load regardless of the length so 20 feet you would have two question number five the most important hand signal you should agree on with your helper is the correct answer is stop and we have an explanation unfortunately let me just scroll this up some unfortunately one oh, pardon me unfortunately once an accident happens you can't take it back that's why it's absolutely essential that you and your helper have a very clear hand signal for stop so that you'll be able to stop what you are doing quickly before an accident occurs question number six how can you start moving without rolling backwards now we have a question here where all the answers are correct so let's go over each and every one of them engage the clutch before removing your foot from the brake put on the parking brake whenever necessary apply the hand valve now we have an explanation so let's go over that if you have a manual transmission vehicle partly engage the clutch before you take your right foot off the brake put on the parking brake whenever necessary to keep from rolling back release the parking bra brake only let me just repeat that release the parking brake only when you have applied enough power engine power to keep the to keep from rolling back on a tractor trailer equipped with 
a trailer brake hand valve, the hand valve can be applied to keep from rolling back. Let's go on to the next question. Question number seven. To maintain alertness during the trip, drivers should. Now in this particular situation, all the answers are correct. We'll go over each one. The first one is get eight to nine hours of sleep. Schedule trips during the daytime hours. And avoid medications that cause drowsiness. Now we have an explanation. Let's go over that. Sleep debt is a dangerous condition in which missing sleep adds up and you risk falling asleep at the wheel until you are, are fully rested. People, often, people are often surprised when they find out that getting less than six hours of sleep per night triples your risk of accident. To prevent drowsiness before a trip, the, drowser, the driver that is, the driver should get adequate sleep. Adults need eight to nine hours of sleep to maintain alertness. Prepare route carefully to identify total distance, stopping points, and other logistic cons logistical considerations. Schedule trips for the hours you are normally awake, not in the middle of the night. Drive with a passenger. Avoid medications that cause drowsiness. Consult your physician if you suffer from daytime sleepiness. Have difficulty sleeping at night or take frequent naps. Incorporate exercise into your daily life to give you more energy. Okay, next question. Question number eight. Which of the following is a key steering component? Okay. Um, none of the distractors are, so the correct answer is the gearbox. And we have an explanation. The gearbox is an integral part of the steering system. All the other options are key pieces of the suspension system. Number 10. What is or makes up a hazardous materials placard? The correct answer is signs on the outside of the vehicle that identify the hazard class of cargo. We have an explanation here. Hazardous material placards are four regulated signs on the outside of the vehicle that identify the hazard class of cargo for those who need to know, such as emergency service personnel or those who load or unload cargo. Next question. Number 11. What will help a person intoxicated with alcohol to sober up? The only correct answer is time. Um, and the explanation is there are no fast answers for getting the alcohol out of your system. Since it is inside your bloodstream, coffee and fresh air will not do the trick. You must wait until you s are sober or you risk losing your CDL if you drive while under the influence. Next question. The minimum tire tread depth for the front tires is 4 30 seconds of an inch. And we have an explanation. The minimum is 4 30 seconds inch depth for tire tread on the front tires, while all the other tires require at least two 30 seconds inch of tread depth. So remember this, front, 4 30 seconds, everything else, 2 30 seconds. Okay, next question. Here we go, number, question number 12. 
Which of the following should you do when confronted by an aggressive driver? Now, this is one of the situations where all the answers are correct, so let's go over each one of the options. Number one, if you can safely do it, call the police from a cell phone. Also, avoid eye contact. And ignore, ignore rude gestures and refuse to react negatively. So all the answers are correct. And we have an explanation here. When an, when an aggressive driver is trying to confront you, don't supply them the conflict they desire. Instead, contact the police and request help. Next question. Question number 13. Where should you place your warning devices if you must stop on a one-way or divided highway? The correct answer is 10 feet, 100 feet, and 200 feet towards approaching traffic. Um, and it helps me, you know, if you're like uh, pulling off on a one-way uh, or divided highway, uh, basically, um, usually the on the approaching traffic is coming from the rear. So all of your uh, warning devices will be in the rear of your vehicle, 10 feet, 100 feet, and at 200 feet. Now we have an explanation here, so let's go over that. On a one-way or divided highway, you want to stretch your warning devices out, but still have them close enough to the vehicle that makes it clear that you are stopped. Devices at 10, 100, and 200 feet accomplish this goal. Next question. Question number 14. Which of these is not part of the basic method for shifting up? So we're looking for the answer that is not part. So um, we know from this multiple choice type of question, we have three that are part. So the three that are part are releasing the clutch, pushing in the clutch, and shifting into higher gear at the same time and releasing the clutch and pressing the accelerator at the same time. But we are looking for the not part. So the not part, which is not, which of these is not part of the basic method of shifting up? That would be accelerating while pressing the clutch and turning toward the driver's side. Uh, we have an explanation here, so let's go over that. You must release the accelerator, push in the clutch, shift to neutral, release the clutch, let the engine and gears slow down for the next gear, then push in the clutch and shift into a higher gear at the same time, then release the clutch and press the accelerator. Acceleration is not involved until the very end and definitely not while pressing the clutch. So let's take a look at these. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. Question number 16, uh, pardon me, 15. During your pre-trip inspection exam, when examining hoses with the instructor, you advise him that you are looking uh, at the ground for, actually I just read that question wrong, you advise him that you are looking for puddles on the ground, okay, which would be indicative of um, leaking hoses, possibly. Um, so, of course all the distractors are incorrect. So let's go and look at the explanation. During your pre-trip test, when inspecting hoses, you need to look for signs of leaks and cracks of the hoses. 
such as puddles on the ground. This a puddle on the ground would would be indicative of uh, a leak, which would result from a, a crack of a hose. It says here fluids are that are dripping on the underside of the engine or transmission. It says also check holds, hoses for leaks or problems. Okay. All right. Next question, number sixteen. What is the gross vehicle weight, GVW? Okay. It's the total weight of a single vehicle and its load. Okay. Now we have an explanation here. GVW is the simplest of the vehicle weight explanations standing for just a single vehicle and the load it is carrying. Next question. Number 17. You should place the starter switch key in your pocket while you are performing the pre-trip inspection because someone could start and move the truck. And if you are, say, behind the vehicle or in front of it, that could be a bad thing. Now we have an explanation here. We're going to go over that. When you are performing a pre-trip inspection, you do not want someone, such as a co-driver, to start your vehicle while unaware of your location and accidentally injure you. Also, if you're looking at the engine and you're checking the belts or something and they start the engine, it could take your hand off. So definitely, you want the keys to the vehicle in your pocket. Next question. Which two special conditions indicate that you are that pardon me, which two indications pardon me, I just keep making mistakes here. Let me correct myself. Which two special which two special conditions indicate that you should downshift? Correct answer is starting down a hill and entering a curve. Let's take a look at the explanation. Downshifting before starting down a hill allows you to take advantage of engine braking. You should downshift to the gear required, which is usually lower than the gear required to climb the hill. Downshifting before a curve improves stability and ensures you will have the power available to accelerate out of the turn. Next question. Which of the following determines the safe speed for going down a steep downgrade. Now this will be all of these are correct. So what are the different components that are of this correct answer? Which of the following determines the safe speed for going down a steep downgrade? The road conditions, the total weight of the vehicle and cargo, the steepness of the grade. There are several factors that help you decide upon a safe speed for going down a steep downgrade, including its steepness, length, the road and weather conditions, and your, ve and your vehicle, and cargo weight. Number 20. Is it true that as long as the engine is not overheated, it is completely safe to remove the radiator cap? No, it's not completely safe. The answer is no. We have an explanation. It is not enough for the engine not to be overheated. The system should have cooled down completely and I emphasize the word completely before you even attempt to remove the radiator cap. 
and even then you should be very careful as there may be tremendous pressure and damaging steam and fluids. Next question. Question number 21. While driving at night, which lights should you use as often as you can? Now, the operative word here is can. You can't always use the high beams, but the correct answer is high beams. Um, and here's the explanation. Let's just go over that. When driving at night, you should be using your high beams to expand your field of vision as often as possible. As long as it is safe and legal and you will not blind any other drivers. The rule of thumb is to put them on as long as there are no approaching vehicles within 500 feet. Next question. Question number 22. It has just reached freezing. Which of the following areas is slippery? Now this is one of the situations or one of the questions where we have all of them are correct. So the components are which of the following areas are slippery? A bridge when it's just reached freezing, a shaded area when it's just reached freezing, a wet looking road when it's just reached freezing. All of those will be slippery. Let's go over the explanation. Once the temperature dips down to freezing, some areas of the road will start to freeze. The, f the first to go will be areas without sun, shaded areas and bridges. If the road appears wet, that could also herald the arrival of black ice, a thin layer of slippery ice through which you can s actually see the road. Okay, next question. What happens when you let air out of hot tires? Okay, the correct answer is this is a bad idea because when the tires cool off, the pressure will be too low. Okay, let's go over the explanation. When tires get hot, when tires get hot, the air pressure rises. However, relieving that pressure will leave the air pressure too low later and the tires may catch fire or blow out. It will also not have a cooling effect. If your tires are too hot to touch, stop until they have cooled down. Okay, next question. Question number 24. To help you stay alert and safe while driving, you should, and the correct answer is, avoid medications with warning labels. We have an explanation, which is, be careful with me medications, be careful with medications that warn you they may cause drowsiness. If you have a concern about prescribed medications, speak to your doctor. Do not even try to make up for sleepiness with coffee, fresh air, or especially alcohol. The only cure for being tired is sleeping until you are rested. Okay, now we have question 25. Okay, which of the following should you not, asking you what you should not do if you experience a tire failure. So you're searching for an option that is not, that is, or you're searching for an option that is inadvisable. In other words, what you're not supposed to do. With respect to this question, 
okay so it's inadvisable to engage the brakes hard and immediately this is what you're not supposed to do okay what are you supposed to do if you experience a tire failure well you need to be aware that the tire has failed okay you need to hold the steering wheel firmly and you need to stay off the brake pedal and here's our um, explanation while it's natural to want to take control of the situation by braking slamming on your brakes could actually put the vehicle out of control so slowly brake once you are in control of the vehicle okay that's been 25 questions we're gonna call this video part one and we will uh, finish the other 25 remaining questions in part two question number 26 to transport cargo safely which of these are you not responsible for so in this question you're searching for the option which relates to non-responsibility what is non-responsibility non-responsibility essentially assuring the freshness of sealed cargo in other words what you're not responsible for is the correct answer so to analyze this question you need to find out what you're not responsible for so your options are which you would say you're responsible for is you're responsible for recognizing possible overloads you're responsible for inspecting the cargo and you're responsible for making sure the cargo is properly secured um, so you're not responsible for the state of sealed cargo nor can you inspect it you are only responsible for the safety of the cargo ensuring that it is balanced secured and not overloaded and does not get in the way of emergency equipment. Question 27. A BC fire extinguisher is not intended to be used on which of the following types of fire? So we're looking for the one uh, that it is not intended to be used on. Well, the correct answer is wood. So a B and C fire extinguisher can be used on grease fire, electrical fire, gasoline fire, and wood fire. So what you need to do is um, acquaint yourself with the different types of fire extinguishers. Now, analyze what type of fire that a B, C extinguisher is intended to be used on. Okay. Um, you cannot use an, a BC extinguisher on a wood fire. Um, a wood fire, uh, water would be the best thing to probably put that out. Um, explanation A BC fire extinguisher is not for use on anything that you can normally use regular water on, which includes wood paper and cloth. These require a ABC fire extinguisher or just an A fire extinguisher. Okay, now so we have the a breakdown on the different types of fire extinguishers here. We have A which is for trash, wood, paper. Fire extinguishers with class A rating are effective against fires involving paper, wood, textiles and plastics. The primary chemical used to fight these fires is monoaluminum phosphate. Because of its ability to smother fires in these types of materials. I'm not so sure about using water on plastic, my personal opinion, um, but I suppose you could do it. Um, but for 
a wood fire, uh, I would definitely suggest water. Now the next class is um, B, which is for liquids. Fire extinguishers with a class B rating are effective against flammable liquid fires. These can be fires where cooking liquids, oil, gasoline, kerosene, or paint have become ignited. Two commonly used chemicals are effective in fighting these types of fires. Monoammonium phosphate, well that's what it is, a mono ammonium. I think I said, might have said monoaluminum, but if I did, I apologize. It's monoammonium phosphate. While sodium bicarbonate includes a chemical reaction which extinguishes the fire, sodium bicarbonate is um, baking soda. Okay, and lastly we have cl uh, Class C, electrical equipment. Fire extinguishers with a Class C rating are suitable for fires in live electrical equipment. Both monoammonium phosphate and sodium bicarbonate are commonly used to fight this type of fire because of their non-conductive properties. Okay, I think that's it on the uh, explanation. Let's take a look at the next question. Question number 28. How many seconds does it take for a normal tractor trailer to clear a double track? The correct answer is more than 15 seconds. The explanation is you can expect it to take more than 15 seconds for a regular tractor trailer to clear a double track and 14 seconds to be safely over a single or to be over a single track. Okay. Number 29, an anti-lock braking system will, correct answer, keep your brakes from locking up when you brake hard. And the explanation is, ABS only really kicks in to save you from over braking and will not change the way you normally brake. It doesn't stop you from needing to engage in careful braking and defensive driving and is no substitution for good brakes and maintenance. It will, however, save you from having your brakes lock and getting in an accident. Question number 30. Why is it important to use a helper when backing? Correct answer is because you have blind spots. The explanation, using a helper when you are backing up is important since you will be dealing with blind spots that you are completely unable to see. Before you start, work out a hand signal for go, for stop, and go. But your most important one is stop, okay? Question 31. Always try to back toward the driver's side because, correct answer, you can see better watching the vehicle rear out of the side window. The explanation is, you should always back toward the driver's side because you will be able to see things much more easily. For example, you can keep an eye on the vehicle's rear by viewing it out of your side window. If your truck pulls toward either direction, it needs service. Your next comfort should not affect your safety decision. Pardon me. Okay, question number 32. How can you determine if your vehicle is equipped with ABS? Now in this particular situation, all the answers are correct. So let's go over each one. Check if your vehicle was manufactured after March 1st, 1998. They are required to have a panel light. Second option, check for yellow ABS malfunction lamps 
on the instrument panel. And final option, look for wheel speed sensor wires that are coming from the wheel, the pardon me, from the rear of your brakes. And again, all these are correct. The explanation is most vehicles now will have a light on the instrument panel that will illuminate briefly when the vehicle is started to alert you about the ABS but you can always check for wires from your brakes. Question 33. The definition of hazard is and the correct answer is a road user or road condition that could be a possible danger. And the explanation is a hazard is something that could go wrong but it won't if you've been vigilant. Question 34. Starting the engine and inspecting the cab involves each of these tasks except so here you're looking for the exception. So well what does it involve? Well it involves checking the transmission controls, it involves checking the air pressure gauge, it involves starting the engine then listening for unusual noises. Okay, but the question is asking for the exception. So the correct answer is what it doesn't involve. It doesn't involve starting the engine then pulling, uh, pardon me, starting the engine then putting the gear shift in neutral. So Now, with respect to this question only, this is not the answer that you're looking for. You're looking for the not answer. So this is sort of like a trick question. Um, instead of asking what you should do, they're asking you basically what you shouldn't do. And here's an explanation. Please note that the question contains an accept clause. When performing this part of the inspection, however, you must put the gear shift in neutral, then start the engine and listen for any unusual noises. Once you perform the engine check, you will check all of your gauges and controls, such as the air pressure gauge and transmission controls. Okay. Question number 35. Which of the following statements about retarders is correct? Well, on this particular question, all of the answers are correct. So let's go over each one. The first option is retarders help slow a vehicle, reducing the need for using your brakes. Section, the second option is you should turn the retarders, retarders off whenever the road is wet, icy, or snow covered. And option number three, when you drive wheels, pardon me, when your drive wheels have poor traction, the retarders may cause them to skid. Again, all of the answers are correct. So let's go to the explanation. While retarders can help reduce the need for your brakes, they can make it more likely for you to skid in inclement weather or whether your wheels experience poor traction, or pardon me, or whenever your wheels experience poor traction, I apologize. Uh, because of this, you should always turn off your retarders in poor weather. Question number 36. What is the best way to figure out how many seconds of following distance you have? The correct answer is wait until a vehicle passes a shadow or a landmark then count the seconds until you pass we have an explanation which says count how long it takes for you to reach the landmark after the car in front of you by counting like so 1001 1002 and you will have your following distance in seconds. All other methods are dangerous and will get you a true following distance and probably will not give you a true following distance. Remember following distance needs to be increased in traffic 
bad weather for heavy vehicles or at higher speeds. Question number 37. You don't want to be a distracted driver. So you, and the correct answer is, turn off your cell phone until you reach your destination. And we have an explanation. Tasks that make you a distracted driver always make you distracted. Whether you think it's an easy portion of your trip or, or a straight section of road, do not eat, drink, smoke, text, read, or have a difficult conversation while driving. In an ideal situation, turn off your phone and keep it off until you are, dr uh, until you are done driving for the day. Question number 38. Which of these is the most important thing to remember about emergency brakes? And the correct answer is, if the wheels are skidding, you cannot control the vehicle. Question number 39. The parking brake should be tested while the vehicle is, and the correct answer is, moving slowly. Question number 40. Which of these statements about tires and hot weather driving are true? The correct answer is, you should inspect your tires more often. Question number 41. What factors determine a person's blood alcohol content? And the correct answer in this particular question is all of the above. So let's look at the options. The first option is how much alcohol you drink. Option number two, how fast you drink. And the third option is how much you weigh. Question number 42. Hazardous material placards are, and the correct answer is all of the above. So let's look at the correct options that we have. Hazardous material placards are placed on the front, rear, and both sides of the vehicle. Second option, 10 and 3 quarters inches square. And the third option, turned upright on a point in a diamond shape. All of these are correct. Question number 43. True or false? When fighting an engine compartment fire, it is best to lift the hood in order to target the fire's base. The correct answer is false. Lifting the hood would permit more oxygen to feed the fire, hence you'd have more of a fire. So leave the hood down and possibly uh, in so lifting it up you could burn yourself. So be careful. Be very careful and um, let's get to the next question. Question number 44. What are the three rules for using your turn signals? The correct answer is 1. Signal early. 2. Signal continuously. And 3. Make sure the signal turns off after the turn is completed. Question number 45. When you are on top of a hill and know you will be going down a steep grade, which statement is true? And the correct answer in this particular case is always downshift to a gear lower than you came up the hill before starting down the grade. Question number 46. Which of these requires a greater stopping distance? And the correct answer is an empty vehicle. Question number 47. When inspecting the parts of a braking system, you should pay special attention to the following. And the correct answer is all of the above. So let's go over the options. Cracked brake drums, 
you should pay attention to that brake shoes with oil grease or fluid on the shoes you should pay attention to that broken missing damaged or heavily worn shoes you should pay attention to that so all the above answers are correct question number 48 when caring for someone who is injured you should and in this particular uh, uh, question all of the answers are correct so let's go over the options option number one only move them if they are in danger from fire or traffic option number two apply direct pressure to any wounds and option number three keep the injured person warm so all of the above are correct question number 49 for an average driver driving 55 miles per hour on a dry pavement in order to bring the vehicle to a stop it will take about and the correct answer is the length of a football field Question number 50. You are driving a 40-foot vehicle at 45 miles per hour. Driving conditions are ideal. Dry pavement, good visibility. The least amount of space that you should keep in front of your vehicle to be safe is the distance you would travel in, and the correct answer is 5 seconds. <laughs> 